one of the most fundamental data structures is arrays. Because of their simplicity, they are a very popular candidate for phone interviews. So let us look at some basic properties of arrays first. A set of elements of the same type, such as 10 integers or 20 floats, stored contiguously in memory is an array. For example, in the figure to the right, we have a set of one byte integers. So if the first element is at address 100, the second element is at address 101, the third element is at address 102, and so on. So if we have to read the second element, we can directly go to that memory location 102 and read the value. So the time complexity to read an element in an array is constant because irrespective of the index of the element or the size of that array, we can directly go to the address of that element and read it. Similarly, the time complexity to modify an element is also constant because we can directly go to the address of that element and change its value. For example, to modify a of 2, we directly go to location 102 and change the value there. However, deleting an element is a little more challenging. Because arrays are stored contiguously in memory, such as, say, 6 is at 100, 16 at 101, and 20 at 102. To delete 16, we just can't drop it off because the array wouldn't be contiguous anymore. So, we try to move all the elements to its right by 1. So, for example, to delete 16, we would move 20 in place of 16, 8 in place of 20, and we can just ignore this value or maybe just put a minus 1 here. So, our new array, after we delete 16, would look like this. The complexity to delete an element like this is big of n because say we deleted the first element we would end up moving n minus 1 elements so these were some basic properties of arrays now let us look at some common array related interview questions that take advantage of these properties This question is very similar to the shuffle function where the songs in a playlist are played in a random order without repetition. In this question, you are asked to print the numbers in this array in a random order without repetition. For example, this is a valid output. So is this. 6, 20, 16, 8. However, something like 6, 20, 6 would not be a valid output because the number 6 is being repeated. A common approach to this problem is to use an additional data structure like a hash table to keep track of the numbers that we have already printed. However, by somehow modifying the input array, we can avoid the use of an additional data structure and additional memory. Here we try to keep track of the numbers that we have already printed by making them negative. So our basic approach is something like this. We first generate a random number from 0 to the length of array minus 1 which is from 0 to 3. Let us say we print, let us say our random number is 1 we print the value at index 1, which is 16. Now we need to make sure that we don't print 16 again. So we make it negative by marking it red. So 
here I'm illustrating negative numbers by marking them red. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that we are making 16 negative. So the value in there is now minus 16. So we continue our process. We generate another random number, say 0. We print the value at index 0, which is 6. And at location 0, we replace 6 by minus 6. We continue generating random numbers. Let us say we generated 1 again. However, we see that the value at 1 is negative, so it means we have already printed it. So we continue generating random numbers. Let us say we generated 3. So we print the value at index 3, which is 8, and make it negative. This solution, of course, works, but there are some problems with it. For example, let us say this array is very large and all but one elements have been printed. So in that case, we'll keep on trying for a long time, generating random numbers somewhere here till we eventually get lucky and get to this number. Besides, this approach would not work for arrays with pre-existing negative numbers because we will get confused between the negative numbers that we have not printed and the numbers that we make negative to keep track of them. So let us look at a more optimized solution. So here, the approach is very similar to the previous problem. we generate a random number and we somehow keep track of it without using an additional data structure but we don't actually make them negative we somehow swap them around in such a way that we will know that this number has already been printed so let us say our first random number is one so we print the value at index one which is 16 and we swap 16 with the last element in the array. So 16 go, becomes the last element and 8 comes in place of 16. So our new array would look like this. We continue our process of generating random numbers. However, we don't generate a random number from 0 to 3 this time. We generate a random number from 0 to 2, which is the length of our effective array. So the random number is 0. We print the value at index 0, which is 6. And like last time, we swap 6 with the last element of the array. Not exactly the last element of the array, but the last element of the effective array. That is the array of length 3. So our new array looks like this. We again continue the process. This time around, generating a number from 0 to 2, which is the length of our effective array. So we again generate a random number, let us say 1, and the value at index 1 is 8, we print 8, and we swap 8 with the last element of the effective array, that is, we swap 8 with itself and decrement the length of the effective array as usual. So our new array looks like this. So we keep on continuing this process till we print all the elements in the array. The key idea is that we could somehow swap elements around and avoid the use of an additional data structure to keep track of the elements that we had already printed. So let us look at another question which is based on stock trading. In this question, the array below indicates the prices of stocks for n days. We are required to find the maximum profit that could have been made. For example, by buying stocks on day 1 and selling them on day 2, a trader could have made $5. He could have also 
say purchase stocks on day one and sold them on day three however in this case the profit would only be four dollars and our aim is to find the maximum profit that could have been made which is five dollars so a naive solution would be something like this for every day we try to calculate the maximum profit that could have been made if the trader were to sell it on that day for, so for example for day one we calculate the maximum profit that could have been made if the stocks were sold on that day for day two we calculate the maximum profit that could have been made if the stocks were sold on that day and so on so we start something like this for day one we look at all the elements from zero to one and identify the smallest price from zero to one to calculate the maximum profit in this case from zero to one the smallest number is three dollars so the maximum profit that could have been made is three minus three zero dollars again for day two we look at all the elements from zero to two and identify the smallest element which is three so the maximum profit is eight minus three five dollars likewise we do the same for all elements from zero to four the smallest number is three so the maximum profit on day three is sorry uh, day four is seven minus three which is four dollars and so on however the complexity of this solution is big of n square because for index one we look behind one element for index two we look behind two elements for three we look behind three elements and so on so the complexity adds up to of n square so let us look at a technique to come up with a better time complexity the technique is to avoid multiple traversals of the array and somehow keep track of the smallest element so at index i equal to zero that is on the first day or i mean the zeroth day the minimum element we have seen so far is phi obviously so the best price or the, i mean the best profit that we can generate is zero dollars we move on to i equal to one and we update the smallest element seen so far to three because that's the smallest element we have so far seen at i equal to one so the maximum profit that we can get by selling the stocks on day one is three minus three which is zero dollars we move on to day two the smallest element we have so far seen is still three so the maximum profit we can get by selling the stocks on day two is eight minus three which is five dollars we move on to day four and day five and so on the time complexity of this approach is o of n because at every i we perform a set of constant operations like updates to the minimum so far element so we do some constant operations here we do a few constant operations here we do the same constant operations here and here and here so the time complexity is O of n. So now we are at our last technique. In this question, you are given an array of integers, but the integers are only zeros or ones. And you are required to transform the array in such a way that all these zeros come in the beginning and ones in the end. So if this is your input array, this should be your output array one obvious way would be to count the number of zeros fill it in the beginning of the array and fill the rest of the array with ones sometimes you may be asked to do it in a single pass so you wouldn't be able to actually traverse the array and count the number of zeros moreover this is a very important technique that could be very useful in 
many other array related questions. So the technique that we are trying to use is to take two pointers, one pointer at the beginning of the array and the other pointer at the end of the array. The pointer at the beginning moves right and as it moves right everything to its behind would be zeros and the pointer at the end moves left and as it moves left everything behind it would be ones. So eventually when the two pointers meet we have all zeros here and all ones here. Let's actually see how it works. So we take a we take the beginning pointer here indicated by the flashing red dot and the end pointer at the end of the array indicated by the flashing green dot. We move the beginning pointer right if its value is a zero. Obviously the value here is not a zero so we can move it. We can't move it so we see if we can move the end pointer. We move it left if its value is 1. There you go, the value is 1. So we can move the end pointer left. Okay, so we move the end pointer left. Well, the value is still 1, so we can continue moving it left. At this point, we cannot move either pointers because this can move further its value is 0 and its value is 1 so we can't move either pointers so we will swap the values of these two pointers so our new array would look like this again We can move the beginning pointer right if its value is a 0, which is the case here. So we continue moving the beginning pointer. Its value is a 0 again. We can continue moving it, but note that when, when I move it, the beginning pointer and the end pointer are going to meet each other. There you go. They met each other, and once they met each other, all the values to the all the values behind the beginning pointer is zero and all the values to the right of the end pointer this is all ones and this is all zeros and this is exactly the kind of transformation we were looking for